My name is Dr. Patrick Tracy and um, welcome to the Global Virtual Aesthetic Summit um, series of lectures. The one I'm going to be looking at today is why do we want to change the facial features? Why are we not happy with the faces that God has given us? I was in Pakistan recently and I was shocked to see that everybody was lining up to be treated by me. Now there was some film stars there, there were some TV personalities, but there was a lot of doctors. So what is it about this industry that some of us, including myself, pioneered back at the end of the last century that has exponentially exploded throughout the world? So I want to look at it from a psychological viewpoint, because most of us spend all our lives injecting people without asking the question, why is everybody coming to us to be injected? And it's across the board. It's young people, it's middle-aged people, and it's older people. And um, this is just my bibliography. I have nothing to declare in terms of any of the products. So first, why do we care about our age? This is Mark Twain and I will look at some of his quotes. He said, age is an issue of mind over matter. But then he followed it up with, if you don't mind, it doesn't matter. And that is probably quite true. Then we have um, Joan Collins, um, who has maintained her features very well into later years. And she had said, age is just a number. It's totally irrelevant, of course, you happen to be a bottle of wine. The problem with beauty is that it's like being born rich and every day you're getting poorer. And there's no doubt about that, that a lot of ladies who would put beauty as one of their, I suppose, assets, feel that as they get older, that um, that asset begins to slip away. So that is possibly one of the reasons, but we're going to look at it in much more detail. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a famous British poet, said, a man is as old as he's feeling, but a woman is as old as she looks. Now, I know those things have come across superficial, but I mean, I look at some of the idioms and maxims that are used throughout our lives to see do they still hold up. I'm going to be in Bhutan very soon, in two weeks' time, <clears throat> and I suppose um, we should think of if people had inner peace, then they probably wouldn't want to change the features at all. But I put it out there, is that true? I don't think it is. There is a driving force outside our own bodies, which is contributory to making all the people come in. And let me look at that. So inner peace, even though you feel, I suppose, an inner calm, and you don't feel the need for some aesthetic enhancement, there is an outside force which is forcing and the truth is that most of us do care. And why do we care about our looks? Let me look at this in more detail. If I look at that woman, I know she's probably white Anglo-Saxon, British or Irish, and she's probably in her 60s, has had a quite successful life, content with the way that life has happened. She looks quite healthy, and I can pick up all that just by looking at her face but I could pick up a lot more. And that is because the face is one of the most important stimuli carrying social meaning and a primary means of communication. If that sounds like a lot, don't worry. We'll look at it in more detail in a moment. So, one of the most rich and powerful tools in, in communication is the face. And within the face, the eyes. Okay, so when we look at somebody, we can make several inferences. If we look at another, most probably white Anglo-Saxon pa person, patient, we know that she's had a harder life, probably the same age. She's quite proud and wrinkled. Years of worry probably has contributed to this complex, glabellar complex. And you can see um, she hasn't really looked after herself. A lot of lentigos on her face, but she does look worried to an extent. So the inferences we can conclude are the obvious ones, identity, where are they from? Gender, male or female, sex, age. 
race. We know that this is, I suppose, a male of the same location, of the same thing. And we know that he's probably middle class, not just from the way he dresses, but from his face. He doesn't seem to have particularly too many worries in his life. So if I extend my inferences now, I can include ethnicity, physical health, maybe even sexual orientation, emotional state, and pain. And this is just all from looking at somebody's face. I give this lecture recently in Abu Dhabi and in Kiev, so that's why I have um, some locals. We know again from this patient's face that she probably has had a hard enough time, possibly due to the conflict in the Middle East, most possibly an Iraqi person, with all the trauma and conflict she's seen there recently. And we see that this woman is happy. I give this lecture in Kiev, and um, I wasn't sure whether it supported the east or the west side. It almost looks like the war graves, possibly of the conflict. She may be on the Russian side. I don't know. But that's the things I mentioned because it doesn't show me. But what I do see is that she's happy. She's had probably good health a lot of her life. She's been exposed to a lot of environmental factors. And um, so we can see from a face. So when does this start? We see immediately that this child is sick. And it's not just because she's lying in a bed. We can see by her features that obviously the external things. The mother is probably trying to feel the child's temperature here. So we have to extend our parameters, I suppose, a little further. Um, it reminds me, during one of my medical exams <coughs> in the Royal, or not in the Royal College of Surgeons, but in Jervis Street Hospital, Port is knocked on, and um, I got um, this patient, very difficult, it wouldn't give me any history, and I had the late Paddy Collins being one of my examiners. And he says, um, uh, Dr. Tracy, um, what do you think is wrong with this patient? And I took a chance and I said, I think he's chronic obstructive airways disease, component of emphysema or asthma. And um, he turned around and he says, are you sure? And I said, I'm pretty sure, yeah. And he said to me, he didn't tell you anything about his illness though, because he deliberately told not to. Why did you pick that up? And I said, well, unless this is somebody else's locker, he's got his Ventolin there, he's got his Amiophilin, he's got all his tablets, and he says, you pass. So it's almost the same thing in this picture. You would know that this child probably um, is ill, probably running a fever. This child is probably sicker. She's probably had, or he, chemotherapy and has lost his hair. If we look at this patient, recently, I think in Syria, um, we can see that this poor person has the worry of the world upon her shoulders. Not only is she very lined, <clears throat> probably lost most of her family, but we can read all this from looking at a person's face. This is Haiti after the um, earthquake, 2010, when I was down there, all these poor people. So then we move into emotion. We see that the face can display all the seven, and people now say um, 13 emotions. This is pain, grimace, sadness. So all these emotions, as well as primary communication, can be seen. But what I'm going to do is go back to just where we were with the inferences. The inferences can also include attractiveness, and this is a very important thing. Social status, as we've seen by that gentleman, deceit, if somebody's telling a lie, you can read it on their face. Pleasure, if they're enjoying herself, you can see it on their face. And even personality traits. So when we see this woman here, remembering all that has happened in her life, again, this is in the Ukraine, this woman the same way. But you see when the next generation comes, how the face lights up. And this is also primary communication. The patient we've seen earlier from the Middle East, we can still read her face, even though 60% of it is obliterated just in the periocular area. So what I'm getting to now is to say, are there other reasons why this is happening? Does beauty play a role? When we look at that patient's face, we see that she's symmetrical. She probably will elevate in social status. But some interesting experiments have been done. 
There was a series of experiments done in the United States some years ago where people who were selling cars would have marked the better complex. In other words, that looked angry. When they were Botoxed, their sales went up 23%. It was allowed to wear off, their sales dropped again. They were retoxed and they went back up again. So even though that paper is quoted on quite a number of occasions, I haven't actually seen it in the literature myself, so I don't know whether it's anecdotal or not. But at the time we started using isopose botulinum toxin, this was a prevalent one. We do know that in court cases, people who are beautiful pay less bail, and that's well proven. We know they get reduced jail sentences, and that's well proven. And there's even been some interesting statistics to show the people with broken noses that if they get rhinoplasties and they're split into two different groups, the ones with straighter noses also have reduced bail and reduced um, jail time. So this is social status per se. Now we do know what a functional MRI as well, that when a person looks at a person who is deemed to be attractive, we get neural activation within the reward circuit. So that's a very important thing to know. If we look at some idioms, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Never ju judge a book by its cover. Beauty is only skin deep. Let's look at those for a moment. These are widely held beliefs throughout the world. Landos, Kelankas, Rubinstein wrote this paper and they looked at it and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's not. Believe it or not, contrary to common assumption, both adult and children's agree who is attractive. This is important. And this holds across all ethnicities and all cultures. So there is a universal standard that beauty is judged by. So think about that for a moment. It is technically saying that when scientifically we evaluate beauty, it's not on the eye of the beholder, but everybody has the same standards. And there's a reason for this. And I'll go into it in a moment. is because we're born innately with a perception of what is beautiful, why it is beautiful, what is symmetrical, and hence what is healthy. I'll go into it in more detail in a moment. So if we look at this um, patient here, and we see that she is beautiful by any standards, so it doesn't matter on ethnicity, and this patient is very possibly beautiful as well, even though we can't make out her total face. We run by things like her eyebrows running at a particular angle, her eyes itself, even though I must say that her right eyebrow does look slightly asymmetrical. This patient here, she recurs in my lecture because of what we've read. If we look at the next idiom, do we judge a book by its cover? Yes, we do, because it says don't judge a book by its cover, but science shows that adults and children judge attractive adults and children more favorably than unattractive adults and adults and children treat other adults and children more positively than they do unattractive. And maybe people may turn around and say, oh, that's unfair, that's not right, and particularly in the political correct world we live in, who try to change many of the um, things in society, science shows that we do this. And that is because we're innately born with a judgment system that is based on attractiveness. I'll go into that in more detail later as well. These are some children. I do humanitarian work around the world to an extent. Now, beauty is only skin deep. It's not, believe it or not. Beauty is more than skin deep. Although both attractive and unattractive people exhibit positive behaviors and traits, attractive people exhibit more positive traits than unattractive people. And as a consequence of this, they are treated differently and people who respond to them learn by cognitive process to treat them differently. And again, I'll go into it in a little more detail. I'm sort of building up towards something that is going to surprise you. This is a paper I wrote so many years ago, just when we were talking in terms of political correctness um, <clears throat> and its effect on society. One of the last great prejudices that are left in society against minorities is people who have got faces that have been damaged in accidents, in burns, in fires. 
like Katy Piper down here at the end. And why is that? Why is it that in terms of race, we've changed society? In terms of sexuality, we've changed society. In terms of ethnicity, we've changed society. But still, if there is a person with a burnt face on a bus, nobody sit beside them. And this has been well proven. People who would make up artists on London buses and nobody would sit there. Even though we know that if we were to reproduce with them, this, would not, this defect would not be carried into the next generation. So we have got to think for a moment about this. So if you consider for a moment that nobody sits there, can you imagine then it's not a learned behavior? Something innately is driving us away from sitting on that seat saying, stay away from this person, this person may harm you, blah, blah, blah. Now, the interesting thing is that if we look at two different groups of people, one young and one old, if we look at young, the reason that we're attracted towards good-looking people is because innately it is in our genes. Believe it or not, and I'll show you in a moment, a three-year-old child will respond to a beautiful person before its own mother. It'll stop crying with a symmetrical person before its own mother. And the reason at three months it changes over is that it learns who its mother is by reward scheme. But until that point in time, a three-month-old child will respond to a beautiful person better. So this is something that is hardwired into us. We know that possibly somebody who is asymmetrical is possibly unhealthy. So it's nature's way, we think, and most probably it is true, of weeding out bad genes. So we're born with this process that even a newborn child has it. So then, after the innate bit, you have cognitive sensory processing, that is learned. In other words, if you look well, people respond to you better, they chat to you more in the pub, and so you try and look better. And again, positive development interaction, that's all learned. That's sort of, we know that if you lift your eyebrows, that they're not, get rid of your fat pads underneath your eyes, turn your lips back up, all those things, people respond to you different. Because nobody probably wants to sit down and have a conversation with somebody that looks tired. That's the way we are. Now, again, if we look at older people, they're the same. Initially, you had a situation when they were younger, innately they had this evolutionary mate selection theory coming into a point. Then they learned through cognitive sensory processing to make themselves better looking, and as a consequence, they would um, have a better response. Now, the interesting thing is because there's two different factors running. One, we're hardwired innately, and the other one, is learned behavior and because of that then it goes across all age groups to an extent. A child as I mentioned earlier up to the period of three months will respond to a person who has seemed more attractive than to its own mother and again that sort of stare that you see that a mother assumes it's because of some bonding um, thing because of intrauterine development or the fact that the cells are the same. Science does not um, I suppose agree with that to an extent that the child responds to his own mother after a period of time. So a next lecture I'm going to do later on is why does aging occur at all and we'll go into the parameters of I suppose um, the golden ratio but um, that is the end of the lecture on um, why do we want to change your faces. Thank you.